this format is kind of is going to be different from formats before. We want to make it very interactive. So I'm going to pose a few questions, but feel free at any time if you have a question to come forward or raise your hand so that you can also address Ken and Tendry. Okay? So don't be shy. So the first question is, um, who is Ted Ken Singer? And Ted Jr. I really don't know that yet. <laughs> well, Ted Ginn Sr. is a guy that uh, came from the South during segregation time. You know, I was a cotton picker, young guy, 19 years old, a little mischievous, didn't really uh, understand segregation, didn't, didn't really even care about it. You know, I didn't understand it, and I stayed with my grandparents in the South, and at age 11, came to Cleveland. I didn't want to come. I didn't know anything about the big city. I was just used to cotton fields, corn, the woods, the creeks and ponds. But even when I was in the South, I was a little different than everybody else. I always had a thought in my mind. I was always a thinker. I always looked at things totally different. And this one example in the South doing segregation, I never did understand why we have a fair. Like here you got Euclid Beach, I mean uh, Jarga Lake, and all those different places, you see the porch. We didn't have that when I was there. But we had a fair that came in once a year. And I never could understand why we couldn't go to the fair during the week. We could only go one day, and that was on fair on the last day. And before that, all the white folks could go all week. And I struggled with that. But like I was the only child, and I didn't have anybody to play with, so I had these different schemes in my mind to keep myself occupied. So that's, that's starting me out there, because a lot of things that you do in your life, you end up living your life that way. So I came to Cleveland, big city, big, big buildings, you know, never saw street cars and buses and all these different things. So when I came here, I felt like I was out of place. A uh, little bit behind, academically, didn't understand certain things, you know, coming from the South in the country. But I was always a listener and a thinker, and I was different. So <clears throat> that leads me to who I am today. Um, being a guy that's an advocate for people, because when I was younger, all I can remember my grandparents being an advocate for people, you know, mean African American people. You know, in the segregation time, they fall for different things. So, it, so what led me to who I am today is, is that, you know, um, I worked in the industry. I went to Glenville. Everything I did in my life today came from Glenville. I went to Glenville, graduated in 1974. Um, didn't really thought about it. I didn't think about going to school or anything like that. I just loved football and then wanted a job. So I worked in the industry for early part of my career as a machinist, and that came from Olympia High School. So when I was working in industry, I didn't see my value of working in the industry because you're working with metal. You, you know, uh, people making money but I didn't see what I was doing. So I was never comfortable with that. Like I told you before, I was a, a thinker and, it, and I had to see what I'm doing. Um, after that industry thing, I got laid off. So, no, prior to the getting laid off, at 19, I graduated 74, 76, my mom died. And I started to go astray a little bit, and my coach, Coach Hubbard, who's the head coach at Glenville High School, told me to come down to Glenville. I want you to show this boy how to snap the ball. So when I, I said, well, you know, why should I show him how to snap the ball? I said, that's what I'm telling you what to do. So I started, that's how I started my coaching career, by somebody looking after me and started me off in coaching, but trying to stop me from being in the street. 
So that started, so I've been coaching at Glenville since 1976. I just didn't show up in 97. <laughs> so as 19 years old, you know, uh, I started coaching, which I saw the impact that I had on young folks. And then, I, like I say, once again, I was a thinker. And I said, this is an opportunity for me to help somebody live different than I lived when I was 10, 11 years old. And uh, I started coaching at Glenville, and I volunteered from 1976 to 86, didn't get a dime. But I enjoyed every bit, of, every bit of it because I was making a difference in somebody's life, that somebody made a difference in my life. So that's just a little start of who I am, and I can move on and on and on to get you to 2012. But that's the beginning. It's been a, a mischievous guy, not really understanding, didn't like the rules that was being played in the world. And when I got an opportunity, I took advantage of it. Can you talk about, I think everyone knows Ted Ginn Sr., the coach. Can you talk about some other ventures that you have as far as um, businesses, like meetings with University Hospital, I know we met this week. And you talked a lot about football and people using that as an avenue, but it's a distraction. So maybe you want to talk about that? Well, I think that what I do for a living is a business. So, you know, being a, an advocate for people and young people, and African American males, first of all, I started off with girls anyway, dealing with, dealing with uh, the sport. But if you, if you look at what I do for a living, is a business. And I think it's a business that is, is overlooked in the world today. Uh, you know, somebody got to be the advocate for people and young people and giving them a proper understanding about life. And that led me into where I'm at as far as coaching it led me into where I'm at is having a, a school for education but it still leads me even more so now than ever before because of the different things that I've went through in the last few months um, you know time is something that, that, that is important it's time is something that you can't get back and and if you don't react today on what you need to do Tomorrow is not promised to you. So it's so many things that I can talk to you about, just about dealing with, with life, you know. I'm not a football coach. Let's talk about coaching. Coaching is, is, is teaching people how to navigate through the world, how to be productive, how to know the information, how to network, how to know how to deal with different situations that comes in your life. You know, I just use football and track and, and uh, all that stuff just to, as a vehicle to, to, to ride in. You know, if I ask you here today, you know, do you drive? Do you have a car? Do you take care of your car? You know, you'll say yeah. So when, when, we, when I look at people, I ask them that question because if you take care of your car, that's the way you got to look at education as a vehicle. That's the way you go to school. You, you have to take care of school because it's going to carry you through life. You'll understand about life. It's going to carry you through life. I think today's time, they don't give you enough information, give you enough exposure to, uh, to deal in the world. You always knew, I'm a little older than everybody here, I think. You understand? But, you know, I can remember the old folks telling me, you know, we living in our last days. And then I really look at that like that. You know, if you see the things that's going on in the world, who are directing the world? It's people that's all about fast. We don't slow nothing down. So if you think we're moving fast, we're going to miss something. So we got to slow it down and clear it up and focus right. Because if you're moving fast, it's just a blur. So, you know, we can talk about a whole lot of things, you know, but. <clears throat> I'm just a different person. I'm an advocate for my people. I'm an advocate for young people. And you know, the world is, is a dangerous place to be if you don't understand it.
maybe you can talk about some of the obstacles you face as a coach or um, failures that you went through as a businessman or things that might have stopped you or motivated you motivated you to work harder. Well, well, you know, it's that, it's that um, the things that the coach, the obstacles that I had to go through, I think that uh, one of the major things was the fact that I wasn't a guy that was accepted as a coach because I wasn't educated and I didn't go to college or anything like that. Um, I had to knock down a lot of racial barriers to get where I'm at today to help people. You know, it was not so much for me, it was for the people that I'm trying to lead, trying to be the advocate for everybody to give them a chance in life. And it's a lot of racial barriers that you have to get over, you understand? So those racial barriers led me into the way I think today. You know, if, if, if they look judge you as who you are and where you come from, and your educational background, you understand? That's the way they look at us all the time as African American people because of where we stay. That's just a myth. That's just something that somebody's saying. You know, because I stay on St. Clair, I cannot be a millionaire. I can't be great. No. But that's the way the world works. That's the way people shut you down. So all those things are things that I struggle with, but I didn't just start that at, as a as 20 years or 25 years old. I was like that at 9 and 10. When I saw, when I saw the, the people take my grandparents' land, you know, because they didn't pay $1,200 in taxes and put us out. See, all that kind of stuff is happening today, but in a different way. So you got to be as smart as a fox when you're dealing with, with the world. We are prejudiced to ourselves, and we have to be different. You know, prejudice don't always come in color. It comes in the, in, the, in your educational background, or who you are, or, or how did you get there. You, you got to deal with that, you know. We can't, we can't see millionaires on St. Clair. You know, people ask me all the time, that why, you, why Cleveland? Why you stay in Cleveland? Because Cleveland's where I'm from. You understand? Know St. Clair is where I'm from. You know what I'm saying? That, and I'm proud of that, you know? And I had all type of opportunity to go to Texas, different places like that, and to pay you $150, $120, $120,000 just to coach football. And I turned it down because my people here need help. This is where my work is at. You know, and for years, just by being a, a, a student that went to Glenville in the 70s, nobody had expectation for us. Nobody had greatness in our expectation. So I stayed, and I, was, and I walked the streets of St. Clair and looked around, you understand? Because you know what? There's plenty of diamonds in this mine over here. You understand? So I dig them out and brush them off. <laughs> And I stay here because there's greatness in this room. You can't tell me it's not. The mayor of Cleveland can be in this room. And that's real talk, but you got to believe that and you got to act towards that. You know, I stay in Cleveland because Cleveland is a great place to be. Ohio, the city of Cleveland is great. You know, and, and, and the things that, that really drives me, that really drives me is the fact of the dollars. See, when you doubt something, or doubt me doing something for us, you know what I'm saying, that drives me. You know, being a servant is, is, is something that I do. And a servant that we invest in others and not look for anything in return. You know what I'm saying, that's what a servant is. You know what I'm saying, so I'm going to serve in Cleveland till I die. You know what I'm saying, because that's what I believe in. Volunteering and not making money at that point, but you still did it because you liked it, because you loved it. Maybe you can talk about in this day and age, a lot of people aren't chasing the money like they want to make money. At what point is it more about passion or how did that deter you or keep you focused on your dream? Well, you know, it's
You know, you can't chase money, money catch you. You know, you know, you can't, it's just like playing the numbers. You know, I hit the number, no, you didn't hit the number, the number hit you. You just was down when it came out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It don't work like that. You know, I think that when you serve and you do everything the right way, the money is gonna come. It's just like making a cake. If you take and put all the ingredients in people, and all the, and that could be the total understanding, the belief, the trust, all that. But when you put all the ingredients in the cake and you put it in the oven on 350, I've never seen a cake say you can't reach it, say don't rise. Freak. <laughs> you know that, that bad boy is gonna come up. You understand? Know but if you leave anything out, it's not gonna rise, it's gonna be a whole cake and it's gonna stay flat. You know, and that's just how I think about people. That's how I think about young folks. You know, the, the biggest thing that, that we miss is the fact that we don't believe. You know, and we don't, we, 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 we let these people have these different opinions of us because of where we come from. Um, you know, I can go from all type of angles, you know. It's a blessing for me to sit here today because I look around, I see all my kids, you understand, when they was running around in diapers, you know, and I can look at them as adults and say, maybe I did touch them in some type of way, you know, to give them an opportunity in life, you know. So somebody got to run the race for you, and then you got to follow but you got to believe in it, you know. So it's so many things that goes on with me, you know, because it takes courage to be different. That's my favorite quote. You know, I don't follow nobody. I got my own mind, I got my own thoughts, and I got greatness on my heart. You understand? And I got greatness for my people. Okay, now that might be a problem. I'm still trying to coach you. <laughs> You know, he's a hard-headed guy, for real. Yeah, no, I'm no, just playing. You know, well, you know, it, it was an honor and a privilege to be able to coach his son. You know, Ted was a kid that didn't have a plan. He didn't have, all he did was just do what you say. But he didn't have a plan like everybody else. Being a parent, you know, I hear people all the time, it's hard being a parent. It's not hard being a parent. It's not hard leading nobody. You know, you talk about kids, you talk about, well, this kid is bad, that kid. I never met a bad kid, but I've met bad adults. You know what I'm saying? You know, my son, to me, was the guy that never was the greatest athlete. And that's hard to say. He was the slowest guy on the field. You know what I'm saying? He ran a 5-140, if you know anything about that, as a ninth grader. But he left running a 4 2 You know what I'm saying? That's because of a, of a belief. He was top 10 in his class when he didn't believe that. He didn't believe he could be great. He didn't believe, just like I could say to everybody else, but it was built. And, it, and, and you know, my wife, she's sitting over there, she didn't understand me too either. He didn't understand me. They wanted to put me out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And they still say I'm kind of crazy. But I'm not crazy, I just have a different understanding, you understand? So when you lead somebody, and like I told you before, when you're a servant, you're, you, you like to serve people and invest in their development and don't look for anything in return. You know, but, you know, coaching my son was one of the greatest experiences. And mind you, I really never coached him. I let everybody else coach him. You know, I never did bother him at home about football, track, none of that. We get in the car, I didn't bother him. I let somebody else do that. When we go home, it was about home. It was about business. You know, when people would tell you, I bet you it was hard working, living with your dad. You understand? Know because I'm a different guy on the field than I am at home. And I treated every kid in here, so many guys in here I coach, I treated them the same way. I'm dead serious about your life. You know, he was, it's fortunate to have him, but it's also fortunate for him to have me. You know, because I was strictly in behind him and support him that I didn't, wasn't going to let society dictate who he was going to be. And that's what I talk about every day to everybody. 
because society would 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 teach would will um excuse me would determine your destination about where because of where you come from. But it's one thing that I can say, even coaching him, coaching him, uh, being around him, that's a void in my heart that I can never ever feel. <laughs> you can go on the professional level, you can do all that. Two boys, and I'll never be able to fulfill in my life again. Was coaching them, and not coaching them in the game, just being that director of his life, you know, going out to college, and to see him come out that tunnel at Ohio State, I can never fulfill that again. And I don't know nothing in the world can help me with that. The professional level, I don't like, because it's too much of a business. It's not about the, the relationship and all that stuff that, that it should be, even though you're getting paid. But you know, as a, as a parent, as a coach, as a leader, as a servant, you know what I'm saying? I couldn't ask for nothing better than to have Terry Gibb Jr. Uh, well, first, you know, I think I'm a role model. Uh, like he say, man, we were set on this earth to do different things, you know, and uh, he, led, he led a plan, you know, and I walked it. You know, and, uh, it wasn't easy. It was tough time to time. But at the end of the day, it made me who I am. You know, uh, I'm glad to be a Tig Jr. That's why I named my son Tig Jr. <laughs> you know, one you know, thing that y'all just taught us was, you know, uh, it ain't gonna be easy. You know, and one thing he put in me was a fight. You know, like he said, I wasn't the best athlete. I wasn't the best student, you know. Uh, it was times that I had to come home and teachers would tell me I wasn't going to be nothing but a hamburger flip. You know, uh, in the fifth grade I remember, you know, uh, being kicked out of St. Out of Wishes and sitting on the, on the curb until my parents came just because they couldn't understand the way that I think or the way that I work in class. You know, and uh, through all them tough times, you know, it made me become who I am to be able to go to the Ohio State University and be a first rounder and, and continue to be role models for the young guys that come up today. You know, so uh, Ted and Jr. is nothing but a role model and an advocate of the Glenville High School student. As being a role model and advocate of Glenville, um, you are now in the NFL as the Carolina Panther. So if you don't mind, just kind of telling us a little bit about your career in the NFL. Well, you know, first off, uh, like I said, I went uh, first round, ninth pick to the Miami Dolphins, was I spent three years there. And my three years there, um, I was very young-minded, you know, uh, very uh, immature, you know, and some of the things that I was taught as a child, you know, kind of left a little bit, and that was because of a couple of dollars. You know, uh, as I grew up in the league and paid attention and learned the league, just like people say, learn the world, you know. Uh, you know, uh, I just took it and I ran with it, you know. Uh, it was things that, you know, happened to, to me in the three years that I would never want nobody to go through or, or, you know, attain, you know, I tell guys all the time, man, stay in school, you know, and uh, continue to get all the education, get a degree, you know, and I left out early, and uh, one of the things that I regret was not staying that last year, you know, and one thing about staying that last year was, you know, fulfillment for my pops, fulfillment for me, my kids, my mom, you know, being able to, to get a degree, you know, but uh, being in the NFL, you know, it's been great, but it's been a struggle. You know, like I said, I got traded, you know, uh, my third year, 
because of a, of a guy, Bill Parcells, as you guys know, came in, he wanted to do it his way, you know, and sometimes you get stuck in a situation where you got to go with, 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 with what they give you, you know, uh, went out to San Fran, uh, caught a couple passes my first year, and then my second year I sailed, uh, had a great year, you know, did some things to lead my team to the playoffs and, you know, um, ended up getting hurt uh, before the biggest game of my career, you know, and then uh, it kind of led over into the off season. came back the next year, which was, you know, the Super Bowl year, and didn't play it down as a receiver. Like I told my group earlier, I had, what, three catches, you know, uh, and if it wasn't for my backbone, which, which is my old man and my mom and my girl at that time, you know, uh, I could have went a one, you know, and, and it was tough, you know, just sitting there watching a guy play over you that don't even deserve a chance. And it's hard to say that, but it was real, you know, and then seeing the book my pops went through in the time that I wasn't having the best that I could have, you know, uh, took me to a whole other stage, took me to a whole other mind stage, you know. Uh, he was in the hospital, you know, I'm calling him. He can't really talk back to me, you know. Uh, like he said, man, he had an opportunity to come out and be a San Francisco 49er coach, and then they don't play his son. So, you know, at the end of the day, it was nothing but a business movie, you know, and that opportunity that we had, the man upstairs wasn't going to give it to him. So, you know, being in the NFL, it ain't always the money, um, the, the TV, you know, uh, the catches, the yards, you know. Uh, it's all about passion. And if you lose your passion in this game, you know, I could easily be standing next to you guys. And I'm not saying that in a bad way, you know, but my passion is to play football. My passion is to be the role model that I'm going to continue to be, you know, uh, the uh, the guy that, you know, you can call my phone and I'm going to tell you real, you know, because I live it. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, my goal is to try to get my 15 in, I'm on seven, and that's what I'm trying to do. And any means necessary to do it. Actually, it was just it was last year. You know, uh, I had to come home, sit down with Crystal. I used to cry. I used to ride home from the, from the games, crying. You know, just not understanding why I was put in this battle that I was put in. You know, I, I've been so great in so many people's eyes for so many years. You know, I just couldn't understand why I couldn't get my opportunity. You know, I could call my friends. You know, and they used to tell me, hey man, keep your head up. You know, and it was tough because my backbone was down. You know, and uh, my mom, you know, she's a mother. She, she didn't understand it. You know, and uh, it, was, it, it, it was rough. You know, but at the end of the day, he always told me, he said, son, the best thing that you can do out of the situation is keep your name. You know. And, you know, I watched a couple opportunities that was in front of me that wasn't was getting the same treatment. And they end up, you know, releasing him, uh, you know, messing him all the way up to now he can't even get a job. You know, and I was just fortunate to be able to, you know, be a free agent and being able to get picked up by the, by, by the Panthers. Because as you can see, more years that you put in, they, they tend to cut back, you know. It, it ain't as good and as great as it is your first couple of years. So, you know, for me to be able to keep my name and fight through what I fought through, you know, I just took a hold of the route this year, you know, and, and hope that I can just continue my legacy and um, just keep putting on for, for my family and my city. That, um, you know, the longer you're in the, the league, um, the more cutbacks they do. So what is next for Tavia? 
First of all, I want to go back and get my degree. Um, and, you know, uh, that's, that's something that I really want to do for me and uh, my mom, my kids, my father. You know, so uh, the next is, you know, uh, I, I want to take the, the, the agent route. I want to be an agent, you know. Uh, so I'm going to try to take my courses to be an agent. You know, and then after that, you know, just be able to come back and, and work at any academy, you know, and uh, keep the legacy going for the young guys that I see every day, you know. And, Thank you. <laughs> you know, that's just really it, you know. Like I say, like Pop said, he, he, he laid a foundation down, and at the end of the day, you know, again, man, gotta keep walking. So once he stopped, I hope I can continue. world. Uh, you know, I think that I'm in the right place when I'm on St. Clair. You know? <laughs> you know, because they need to see me in the hood. They need to see me at the barber shop on St. Clair. They need to see me at the corner store. I think that the, the person that's not safe is the person that, that goes home I go to work every day that only concern is what, what they make don't have the proper understanding how the world works, go out to their nice, beautiful home, gated community, and open up their doors, go and eat their food, and don't care about what's going on around them, and go to the corner store and get their head knocked off. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, because they're very naive to life. You know, so I, I play the game. You know, I'm, I, I'm on all corners. It could be on St. Clair, it could be on 55th and Ensign, it could be on Kinsman Corlett, it could be on Solon, it could be in uh, Twinsburg, so I know everybody. You know, so where you stay is where your heart is. Anybody else have any questions? I have two questions. What was oh for singer? What was the um, the hardest obstacles that you went through opening a charter school? Okay. The obstacles, excuse me, that I went through. Well, first of all, I'm not a charter school. No. I'm a regular public high school like Linville and all the other schools, Collinwood, East Tech. <laughs> I'm just an innovative school under the Cleveland district obstacles that I had to get over was that prejudice thing. You know, what do he know about education? He's a security guard, he's a football coach, and he didn't go to college. He don't have a degree, and that was one obstacle I had to overcome. But it's like any other business. It's not, I don't need to know all that. I don't need to know math, science, or study English. I hire people to know that. <laughs> you understand? You think Henry Ford knew how to build a motor? No, he didn't. He said, I want an eight cylinder. So he go find the people to build that. And that's the one thing that we have to deal with. And that's when I go back to people who judge you for who you are and where you live and where you come from. So that was a big obstacle that I had to overcome. But one of the things that, that I did have to deal with was this. When I first started, it was the lack of belief. So then give it to him. Let him do it. He'll be on the fall on his face in a year. Okay? What happened was they gave it to me and let me do it the right way. The first time, became the best school in the state of Ohio. We had the best test scores in the state. And I got guys in here with the first class. Raise your hand if you Yeah. He was part of that first class that believed we had the best test scores in the state of Ohio. And that was the worst thing that we could have done. Because you know what happens in this type of world? The educational world? Wait a minute. We gave you that for you to fail. We didn't give you that to, to achieve greatness. You understand? Know you got to take all, he got too much power. You understand? Know so they took it away. Because you know why? Because when we were sitting in places, 
I might be sitting up with the CEO and he getting an education award and I'm sitting next to him and I ain't spending a day in college. That's embarrassing to them. Not what's right for kids. You understand? So I had to deal with that. But they have to deal with that. You understand? So those are some of the things I had to deal with, but it's not me, it's them. You know, so that's what I said. I have one more. Um, um, for senior again, are you going to write like a book of your journey, like in the future? Mm -hmm. The question was, am I going to write a book about my journey? I write it every day. Okay. Dude, Ms. Parker over there, we probably got 10, 15 years worth of data that we have gotten together. You know, and it gets bigger every day, you know, uh, different obstacles that you got to overcome. But the book right now is the man with the medicine. You understand? Because when you're dealing with people, you understand? Everybody got an illness, but you can't medicate them all the same. You know, and that's the, the title of the book right now, the man with the medicine. Now, because I can't treat Ted, Leo, Sully the same way because they got different symptoms. <laughs> and especially Lil C. <laughs> I got to hit him with a little something different, you know what I'm saying? So that's the reason why the man with the medicine, because I got to be ready to go into my doctor bag and pull out the right medication, you know? Okay. Uh, question for Ted Jr. Uh, you got the fame, the fortune, all that. How do you remain humble amongst all of that? Well, first off, you know, uh, I was never the type of guy that ever gets in my head anyway. Um, the things that I do is what I want to do. It was nothing that uh, nobody put on me or forced on me. So uh, all my accomplishments and all the things that I do, uh, I do it for others. You know, uh, like like a, like, a, like a shame, a just, you know, trap, a zay, you know, like different guys like that. that look up to me, you know, um, because a long time ago a dude told me uh, records are made to be broken, you know, so fame and fortune can easily be broken any day. So at the end of the, at the, end of the day, I just want everybody to say, hey, he still remains Ted and Junior. If you know the system, and, and this goes for not only just Ted, but it goes for some of the guys here. When you know the system, they are taught to be humble. You understand? They are taught to give back. They are taught to be servant. You understand? They know that. You know, so it just naturally comes out of them. And then they have a mindset of, of the Guinn Academy or in the Glenville mindset of to serve and to be proud and to give back. That was, that was poured into them just like the, the hard work, the dedication to their sport, their classroom, stuff like that. So it becomes natural. So we can't be so high and mighty because God can take that from you at any time. How did you keep him motivated and how did you individually stay motivated? Well, uh, one way that I stayed motivated was my backing. You know, uh, like I said, I wasn't the, the smartest student. I wasn't the, the, the athletic guy. But, you know, I had people like Daryl Bowden, you know, to come pick me up from school every day. And, uh, give me my spelling tests in the middle of the hallway interview at, at 8 to 12, you know. Um, you know, I had different people that was behind me, that stayed behind me, you know. Like you said, he wasn't always, you know, the front run, you know. So, um, like I was telling my group, you know, I could pick up the phone and talk to 10 different guys, 
you know, and they gonna tell me the same thing that he will. You know, so uh, at the end of the day, it's kind of like a company you keep. Uh, it's kind of like uh, being able to grow up and listen outside of your home. You know, that's what he taught. Me, you know, uh, if it wasn't for guys like Jim Trestle, Mel Tucker, you know, uh, I had a, I had a, uh, a tutor in college. Her name was Crystal. And she was, <laughs> and she and she was just you know on me all the time you know and it's about how you open up yourself to people so people can give back to you just as well as you give it to them. Well, as a parent, you know you got to be the eyes and ears for your kid. And you got to be the front runner. Uh, to keep him motivated, you keep putting the period in front of him and showing him the, the vision of what he can become. You know, and that's what you that's what I do in life. You know, I try to cause kids today don't care about what you say out of your mouth. They got to see themselves in what you're saying. That's even with teaching. That's in everything that you do. And that's when a lot of people struggle as parents, that's when a lot of people struggle as teachers and as leaders. If the kids don't see it, if you can't paint a picture for them, you understand, you're gonna, they're going to lose the motivation and then you're going to be frustrated. And then when you get frustrated, because sometimes you be, got to be a great fisherman. You understand, you got to learn how to change your hook. You understand, sometimes your hook as a parent might be too big for his mouth. You know, that just might be a little blue And you got to get a little bitty hook because he be nibbling. You understand? So you got to get the hook so he can swallow it. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's so many things that you have to do to keep your kids motivated. 